welcome back to Lifers TLC. I'm Laura and Jay isn't here with us today, but I'm super excited because we have Melissa with us tonight. And Melissa is a parent of an organ transplant recipient. So Melissa, can you tell us a little bit about you and about your son, Parker? Yeah, uh, my name is Melissa. Our family lives in Southern California. I have a almost 14 year old son, Parker, who uh, was diagnosed with heart failure um, just about two years ago. It was April of 2019, just about a week before his uh, 12th birthday. Um, he seemed to be pretty stable almost through the first year of his diagnosis. And then actually probably at the beginning of the pandemic last year, we started to see um, a pretty rapid decline. Um, he spent two weeks in the hospital in the middle of the summer, just kind of getting like a, like a cardiac tune up, um, if you will, and, um, sent him back home and it just, it just didn't last very long. So we ended up just a couple weeks later back inpatient, um, and really quickly, we had a lot of really big decisions to make. He went from, um, uh, severe arrhythmias. He kept having to be cardioverted. Um, and then they said, okay, we need to do something even while we're working up for transplant. He's going to need a VAD right away. The night before he went through his VAD surgery, he had such adverse side effects to his um, antirhythm medication that he aspirated on his vomit, ended up with pneumonia, had to be intubated for nine days, Oh my goodness. weighed out the pneumonia before he was even healthy enough for surgery. And even when he had his VAD surgery, that was borderline. He was in real bad shape. Um, and he had his VAD for, uh, almost six weeks when he finally got listed. We thought at this point about five weeks post, um, VAD surgery, we thought we were going to go home, uh, maybe on Mill Renault, maybe not on Mill Renault, but go home, kind of get through the holidays at home and then be listed after the holidays. And, you know, as you know, as a, um, family of a donor patient, the heart wants what the heart wants. And it was just, it was, it was time. Um, so he was listed very high status one a on a Monday afternoon and on a Friday, which was, um, Halloween Eve, he got the call four days. <laughs> so can you tell us, so he has, he had heart failure and obviously, yeah. you know, a 12 year old, especially was that, was he going in just for a normal checkup and it was found or was he having some symptoms? How was it discovered? So he does have a very, very rare form of muscular dystrophy. There are only four documented cases. Um, and we were actually at the NIH um, for a workup, uh, getting our, they were helping his neurologist kind of define the exact type of neuromuscular disease we were dealing with. And during a routine cardiac um, MRI, they found the heart failure. Wow. So he does, it doesn't sound like he was really having any sim symptoms of that at the Not very at the beginning. Time. So mm -hmm. it was just kind of like, okay, you know, that something kind of was on the back burner. It sounds like, but it very quickly changed. Yes. Um, yes. so how was that, you know, so you, you weren't sure you thought maybe you'd go home on the bad and then, you know, that didn't, you know, after the surgery and then that didn't happen. Right. How was that for you to know, like, okay, he's be, you know, he's listed now. Right. But then he's here basically, right. Until he has yeah. a surgery. How was that for you as a mom? You know, we were to the point where we were there just so long. My husband and I fortunately were able to get a room at the Ronald McDonald house just across the street. So we were um, close by our other son was staying with um, his grandparents. So we, I mean, we just, you kind of just kind of get in the motion and um, we kind of just, Told ourselves, okay, we're just here for the long haul. We'll probably spend the holidays here. Um, we can't do anything about it. And during a pandemic, he can't, he couldn't even see his brother. Right. Were you so, and your husband both able to be with him at the same time? I know some hospitals had major restrictions on that. Yeah. So thankfully we were, um, in the circumstances at our, at our center, because we were both staying at Ronald McDonald house. We had both been COVID tested. Um, we were able to go back and forth just through all over campus. So yeah, we were both able to be with him in the room at the same time, which was refreshing. Oh, absolutely. I can't can't imagine going through all of that during a pandemic on top of it all and just the overwhelmingness. Um, so Parker is 12 and so he, he's 13, well, he's 13, he's 13 now. Right. Mm -hmm. So when this is all happening, 
how were these discussions? You don't have to tell us about the personal discussions, but how was it working up to these discussions and ha having having to have them in general? But just what was that like? Right. Everybody wants to have this with their thirteen year old kid, right? Um, thankfully, he is extremely intelligent. He has a level of body awareness that I've never seen in a thirteen year old. Um, and so we just were very matter of fact with him with everything. Um, his team was amazing. They're like, do you have any questions? Like any questions at all? And there was one time where he's like, I've just got some questions. They're like, okay, we're going to come in after lunch and we'll answer all the questions you have. Um, so we just made sure that we were really open with everything with him. Um, and he would tell us when he's scared and we said, well, you know, we're scared too. And it's okay to be scared. And, um, just trying to, validate all of the things he was feeling because we were feeling him too, just in a little bit different way. Absolutely. Can't, that's gotta be, you know, hor teenage hormones and then all of this all on top of it. So then yeah. he got listed, you said on a Monday Monday, yeah, and then five, basically five days later, right. Then he was yeah called and he was called to get the um, organ, the heart um, what was that like? So, you know, you guys were already in the hospital, so you didn't yeah. have to, you know, wait for like the actual call or then you have to come in. But so what was that like for you, you and your husband, you and Parker kind of, once you guys got that call, what was the process? What were you kind of thinking? It, it was really surreal. In fact, the night before, when we were leaving the hospital, yeah. we would you know, get him ready for bed, get him all tucked into bed. Then we'd walk across the street to the Ronald McDonald house it was just a very weird energy between the two of us. And I was like, I just kind of feel like something's happening. And it was, you know, we were coming into a full moon and it was Halloween weekend. And I, I go, I just don't know. Something just feels like it's changing. He goes, yeah, I kind of feel like something's going to happen soon. So no reason, we would have no reason to believe that. Right. Okay. So the next the next morning we get there and, um, we had our normal routine. We would walk over and check on him right before shift change see how his night was with his night nurse. Then we'd walk to Starbucks, grab our coffee and then come back for the day. Um, and so we came back for that day and kind of settled in and his transplant coordinator came in and just like 7.45 in the morning with so much energy. And we're like, she doesn't come here at 7.45 in the morning. Right. So Parker ripped off his BiPAP mask and she's like, we have a really good offer. And he said yes, um, immediately. And then that day was just kind of like very weird. You know, it's just, you can't eat, you can't do anything. He's already not feeling good. He was an AFib again, and they just decided not to cardiovert him this one last time. Um, so it was just, a, just a strange energy. We just sat around, watched movies, played cards, you know, just trying to pass the time. Um, my husband ended up seeing, uh, one of the surgeons and coordinators leave in a vehicle to go get the heart. And shortly after that, the rest of the team came in and they said, okay, well, you know, they're en route to get the heart. And my husband said, yeah, I know. I saw them leave. Um, and you know, then you just wait for visualization and you're kind of on pins and needles because until that surgeon sees the heart and says, yeah, we're taking it. You don't know, you know, anything yeah. can happen. Um, so we had visualization, uh, a, between five and five thirty PM by okay. six o'clock, we were rolling him into the OR. Um, and then I think this was my hardest point of all being a mom, rolling him into that OR at six o'clock, knowing they're getting ready to open him up, explant his VAD, explant his heart, put him on bypass and his new heart is not here yet. Yeah. So that was probably my most difficult three and a half hours of the whole journey. Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine being a mom, being in that situation. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. And so how long was his surgery total? So he went in at six and then we saw him about two forty-five being rolled back from the OR to the CVICU. Um, so about eight hours. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I mean, pretty typical, right? So, I mean, that we're, were his coordinator was somebody coming out and updating you guys like as things progressed. Okay. Yeah, the whole time, um, from the time that we rolled him into the, um, the OR when he was on bypass, 
Um, and they said, he's on bypass. The heart should be here in 45 minutes. Then they called when the heart was there. And then they called when um, they'd sutured the new heart in. And then they called when they removed the cross clamp and the new heart was beating. And um, so then after that, it's like, okay, well, um, the surgeon's going to meet you at such and such time here. And then after that, it was kind of just a real waiting game. Like we already saw the surgeon come out. He was so tired, obviously it was, you know, one 30 in the morning. Um, and that was, then it was kind of a waiting game because, you know, they had to close them up, but it just takes a while. Yeah, absolutely. How long, um, after he got to the ICU, um, were you guys really like comfortable and kind of like had that sigh of relief that like he's back with you, right? Like the mom heart and you, like he's here with me. I can see him. Well, I kind of had a huge sigh of relief when they rolled him back because we were standing in that hallway and, um, you know, we see the familiar faces of an anesthesiologist that has been with him before and he rolls him back and I'm just going to get emotional. And he just gives us like a fist pump, you know? So that a moment was a huge relief. Um, but really, I think for me, when we got to see him about, uh, about four 45 in the morning, um, I had a, a, a massive adrenaline dump. I almost passed out. Uh, I, I, I ended up just going back to the room to take a nap and my husband stayed with them. And then we kind of switched off every couple of hours that day. Um, but yeah, I, once he was back in the, in the, in the ICU, it, it was kind of a huge relief. What's his recovery been like? both physically and mentally and emotionally for not only for him, but for you and kind of, you know, we know that with organ transplantation, it's not just a, it's not a cure, right? It's a treatment for um, an illness in his case, the heart failure. So it's not just like, okay, he's got this great new heart and he's good to go. So what has it been like recovering and kind of moving forward from this? He had a rocky start because he did acquire two donor specific antibodies out of transplant. So we had to do plasmapheresis and IVIG and some therapies, you know, to try to remove those antibodies, which in the beginning, you don't know how successful they are. Now we know the antibodies are gone, which is great. Um, but you know, he just had a little bit rockier start because he was really sick before he got his VAD. He was still pretty underweight. Um, so his, I would say his recovery has been just a little bit more challenging than, um, maybe some other kids that don't, didn't go in so sick. Um, but despite his muscle disease, he's done remarkable, well, re remarkably well. His um, number one goal has always been, well, what do I need to do to get home? So, um, you know, when PT and OT and the nurses give him very clear cut goals, he's one to just, ta you know, tackle him. He's gonna do the next thing he needs to do. Um, and now things are, aren't so crazy. You know, he's on only twice a day medications now and, um, a lot less of them. He's, uh, he'll be six months post next week. Um, 24 weeks. Yeah. So he just, just had his six month biopsy on Monday and everything came back. Great. Yay! Uh, yeah. where they've started, uh, bringing down some of the medications and that, and that's nice, you know, because there's a lot of crazy side effects with those. How often was he having biopsies done? for this first six month period? Um, I want to say, I know he had one like 10 days out and then he had another one before we left. So he had two in the first 20 days. Um, and then I feel like he came back a couple of weeks later for another one. And he had one at three months. And I want to say there was one between three and six. So um, at this point they think the next one will be in another six months, which is nice. That is so nice. Not having to go under again and do all of that is awesome. So how often now does he have to be, you know, either go in and get just blood work done or see his cardiologist? Is that still pretty often? About every three weeks at this point. And, um, you know, that'll start separating out, you know, getting longer between, um, appointments too, as he gets farther out and things stabilize. Yeah. How has his reaction to the anti-rejection medications been? Um, very minor side effects in the beginning. It was a lot. Um, but you know, he kind of adjusted to most of them before he even left the hospital. Um, 
probably the worst was the prednisone because, you, you know, you just get very emotional with it. Forget about like always wanting to eat. And, you know, he did the moon face. He's, he's a teenager. He's very conscious of his appearance. And especially right now he's on, this is how he does school. Yeah. So, and you know, the camera's not super flattering anyway. So when you've got this camera in your face and it, you know, your face is kind of extra large, you know, he was definitely um, self-conscious with that, but that's already starting to go away too. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about him. How does he react it? You know, obviously transplant is a huge deal. He is yeah. a teenager who has friends and everything. Is he able to communicate kind of his thoughts and feelings about it? Does he talk about transplant at all? Is it something that yeah. he just kind of. No, he does. He's actually really proud of his journey. And, um, for a quiet kid that he is, he is willing to talk about his journey with anybody who wants to hear about it. So, you know, it's neat. We haven't seen a ton of family because of the pandemic and except that now that people are getting vaccinated, they're able to see us, but, um, but you know, he'll see one of his aunts or uncles that he hasn't seen. And he's like, Oh, do you want to see my scar? And, you know, um, and he's got a lot of shirts that, you know, um, have like graphic logos about heart transplant and being a heart warrior and whatnot. So he's very proud of his journey. That's awesome. I'm glad he's accepted it so well and is able to talk about it. Cause really, you know, especially being so young, that can really make a difference as you look to, uh, you know, as we, 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 as adults sometimes have a hard time talking sure. about donate life and are you an organ donor? And did you, you know, have you registered? Don't you sign the back of your card register. So the fact that him at 13 is so willing and able to talk about it and share his journey, I think is so awesome. And that has to make you as a mom so proud as well. It does. That's so awesome. So some of the, one of the questions that I like to ask everybody is what is the most challenging thing through this whole process that you've gone through so far? Obviously still got a long road with continuing being his mom and hopefully a lot of bigger problems with girls and (laughs) college and everything in the future, but what would you say with this transplant journey was the most challenging for you? I think now post-transplant, it's, um, my most challenging thing is trying to figure out how I can support him and transitioning to some kind of normalcy to have the most normal experience that he would have, you know, as a almost 14 year old kid, um, he's going into high school next year. Um, and during a pandemic of all things, you know, this, it just adds another layer of complication to everything. So we're really trying to navigate, like, how do we make sure he's safe, but make sure he's able to be happy and be a, a, a teenager, you know, Absolutely. and that's, that's, it's hard. Yeah. I can't imagine being in that position. And what do you think is the is not easiest? What do you think is the best? What is the most joyful part of your journey? Oh, just seeing the changes in him for sure. Um, he's so funny and, he, and, uh, he's got such a quick wit and that was gone for a while because he just didn't feel good. Um, he's a foodie and for the longest time he couldn't eat, you know, when your heart's not functioning, your stomach isn't digesting food. So you really can't eat. So, um, just to see normal Parker come back, um, and see him come out of his shell and have energy that I haven't seen him have in two years. Uh, that's the best. What does he like to do right now? What's he really into? Uh, uh, he got a PS five recently. So (laughs) (laughs) him and my, him and his brother have been doing a lot of playing on that, but you know, he's back to the point where he can go outside and play basketball with his brother, you know, toss around the baseball. Um, yeah. He's excited to travel again when he's allowed to. So, um, we actually just got back from a camping trip at the grand Canyon that was fully supported by his team. And, um, yeah, they were so stoked to be able to do that. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, and then one thing, so because we want to spread awareness and support people, we know that in the transplant and donation world, it is full of misconceptions. Is there a misconception that you have heard or that bothers you the most that you just want to dispel that you can dispel for us? Well, I think the most common one, and I'm sure people have brought this one up is that, you know, if you're in the hospital in a life or death situation and they know you're a donor, they're not going to try to save your life. That's not, that's not true. But aside from that, I think the biggest challenge that we have been met with personally in this is that, um, 
We actually had somebody question uh, whether or not we bought our way to the top of the list. Really? Yeah. yeah. And um, I wasn't even upset. I was just like, this is comical. This is the United States. Like, this isn't a third world country. This isn't Eastern Europe. Like, you, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, it's not possible. Rich people do not get hearts before poor people or famous people don't get hearts before non-famous people. Um, that's just not how it works. Um, so kind of explaining to people that how intricate the matching system is. Um, and it's not, a, it's not if I'm a match, it's if the heart is a match that each organ, each heart, each kidney, each liver, each transplanted organ creates their own list of who's going to match them. Right. Um, and I think that's the heart that's been the most biggest misconception for us. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a great one. And there are um, ways if people are interested, you can see, you can go online and see too, like the categories, like you were talking about before the Parker was one a to see what qualifies and makes somebody higher or lower on a list. Cause those right. can really vary. And people can also, I don't think, um, I don't think everybody realizes that you can move on the list too, yeah. based off of how your health at the time, how you're doing the medications, maybe that they're giving you things can change and you are able to not only just go up on the list, but you can go back down. So that's a really great one. Thank you so much for sharing that one with us. Um, one of my last questions before I ask you if there's anything else, is if there's a mom or dad out there who was just told by their kid's team that they need a transplant, what kind, what words do you have for them? It's okay. It's okay. Um, the it's, it's scary. It is scary and it's okay to be scared. Uh, it's okay to ask all the questions, um, and definitely figure out who your village is because you're going to need them. Absolutely. And that's a great point. And I wanted to bring that, ask you that. And I didn't get it. I forgot to, who was your support, especially during this pandemic, crazy time, you and your husband were kind of stuck together, stuck there at McDonald house. Did you have a support system outside or through social media or anything like support groups? Kind of how, how did you get your support so that you could be the support for Parker? Um, my mom, um, and my husband's parents, they helped take care of my, our other son. Um, so they kind of figured out who had what, and it was very important too, that our support system knew they were also our bubble because if they were taking care of our other son, that meant they couldn't leave our bubble because then we couldn't see our other son. So, um, definitely the grandparents were huge, um, I had so many friends who would just send us care packages to the Ronald McDonald house. We, um, I can't even tell you, I had a, a uh, prayer chain text thread. We, we just really had the support of um, our neighbors, school families, um, and some families just that we know through the community. And it, it was, it, it was huge. It was huge. Cause you really just don't know, even if you don't need anything, you don't know what you need. Right. Absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad that you had such a big support system yeah. and that I'm sure you still continue to and Parker does as well, which yeah. is great. Um, so before I let you go, is there anything else that maybe I didn't ask you that you want everybody to know, or that would be important to share? Make sure you're registered to be an organ donor. This is, uh, this is the month for donate life. So make sure that, uh, you can go online and register, and uh, make sure that you're, you're ready to recycle yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you, Melissa, very much for sharing your and Parker story. It has been great to have you on. And everybody, I will see you next time on Lifers. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks right. for joining us today. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss our next guest. We need your help to spread support and awareness for organ transplant and donation. Please share this video and channel with your friends. Tell someone something that you learned or heard from today's guest. Get in touch with us if you'd like to join us as a guest. See you next time. Peace.